Good evening, Sheridan Hills family. As you guys know, we as a church have been going through and talking about the different attributes of God. And so tonight we're going to be looking at one of those attributes, which is God's veracity, God's truthfulness. And so you may say to me, come, come on, Stephen, this is kind of obvious, right? We all know that God's truthful. There's no, there's no point to talk about this. But uh, in preparing for this, I realized there are actually some very important aspects of God's truthfulness, God's veracity, that are vital for us as we are believing and following in Him. So we're going to look at three aspects uh, this evening. First, we're going to look at the fact of God's truthfulness, God is truth, but also looking at how God's Word is true. And then lastly, looking at how God's truth changes us. So in the Gospels, the Gospel of John is very much about truth. You see the word coming up again and again and again talking about it. So we're going to look at one verse in the Gospel of John for each of these points. So first we're going to start in John 14, 6. It says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So this is one that you've probably heard before, right? Everybody loves to quote this verse because it's so powerful and it's so true. Um, and it's amazing here that when Jesus says this, he doesn't say, I am true. He says, I am the truth, which is a, a difference that we're going to get into just a little bit here. In the aspect of God's truth, that God is truth, there are three, three things that go along together with it. First of all is that God is truthful. He tells the truth. In Numbers 23, 19, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? Simple. God tells the truth. God doesn't lie. And again, you say, uh, come on, seriously. But this is extremely important. Because think about the gods of the people who were around the nation of Israel, as God was revealing himself. What kind of gods were they? They were just superpowered human beings. They had all the faults and all the vices of humans, including lying. This is the way people viewed their gods, their supernatural beings. But the true God, the God of Scripture, the creator of heaven and earth, is completely different than that. He does not go around acting like a man with vices and faults. He does not lie. When he speaks, it is true and it can be counted on. You don't have to wonder if he's wavering from one place to another. This is a huge difference from the people the, the gods of the people that were around the nation of Israel, and it's kind of it's a foundation of who God is and who we in our faith are as well. So, second to that, not just that God is truthful, but God is truth. Right? Jesus says, I am the way and the truth. He is not just truthful, not just that he's true, but he is the truth. You may have heard the saying before that all truth is God's truth. And it's kind of a, a weird saying at first thought, but if you think about it, everything that's created, God created all of it. So when we look around the world and we see truth, we see laws, and we see order in our universe, that comes from God. Yeah, it's not a spiritual truth. It's not something that we, we see talked about a lot in the Bible, but it is still a truth that comes from God. God is truth. And all things that are truth come in some way from Him. So this is a nature of who he is. He's truthful. He is truth. And then there's another one that might not seem so obvious at first, but it's important and vital here, is that God is faithful. You see, one aspect of telling the truth and being truth is that when you say you will do something, you do it. You follow through on your commitments. You know, when God makes a promise, he follows through. In 2 Timothy 2.13, it says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. Being faithful is just an aspect of who he is. He can't be otherwise. He is faithful. He is truth. He is truthful. When he says something, it will happen. God fulfills his promises. And for us as believers, it's extremely important because our whole life in faith is based on the promises that he's given. So if he's not trustworthy, then it's all for nothing. So moving on from that, so we have to ask that God is truth. But not only that, but also God's word is true. In John 17, 17, Jesus says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Your word is truth. In the Old Testament, we have the same idea. 2 Samuel 7, 28. And now, O Lord God, you are God, and your words are true. And you have promised this good thing to your servant. 
The way that we know God is through his word. And so it's vitally important for us to, to, to understand and to know that that word is true. And you can look just internally and to see whether God's word is true or not, but there's also some things external that help us to see that it's true. And this is important, why? Because if you ask me, Stephen, are you an honest person? I say, yeah, 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 I'm an honest person, sure. How do you know if I'm telling the truth or not? You have no way to know, if it's just my word, I say, take my word for it, just take my word for it. You can do that, but it helps if you have some other things, some observations from the outside, some, some corroborating evidence to help you see that it's true. And in the scriptures, we have this. We see supernatural truth in the scriptures. So we see truth in the scriptures even when it doesn't seem important. When the scriptures are talking about history or nature or things that aren't just like the, the center of what's going on, a vitally important thing about our faith, it's still true. One example is the Hittites. Hittites is one of the people groups that were there around ancient Israel. And for, for centuries and centuries and centuries, people mocked the Bible because they said, these Hittites, hey, Hittites, we don't see anything like this in archaeology. We don't see any of the evidence of them in history. The Bible's a lie. Well, lo and behold, eventually, archaeology caught up with the scriptures, and they found that the Hittites, was, the Hittites were this huge empire that were exactly like the scriptures had described them. We see also in this aspect of the fact that the universe had a beginning. There were a long, a long period of time where scientists were mocking Christians. They said the universe is eternal. It has no beginning. It has no beginning. It's just always been there. The Bible is so silly. It says the universe has a beginning. And then Einstein's theory of general relativity came, and people started researching, the, the, looking into the conclusions that came from the theory of relativity, and realized that it pointed to the beginning for the universe. So again, science caught up to the truth that was already there in Scripture from the beginning. There's a lot more examples of this. We have, we have examples of the water cycle. In uh, Ecclesiastes and Amos and Job, we see this aspect of the waters going, evaporating, coming back down as rain. This is something that was enunciated in Scripture before people really understood it. Why? Because when God speaks, it is true. God's word is true in all aspects, even if it seems unimportant. Another thing we see that shows that God's word is true is messianic prophecy. There are prophecy after prophecy after prophecy about the Messiah who would come, what he would do, where he would be born, how he would live, how he would die. Psalm 22, Isaiah 7, Isaiah 53, a lot, a lot of different places we have these prophecies. And this is something that's verifiable. These things were written down hundreds of years before Jesus came and fulfilled them. And he fulfilled them so accurately that it's, it's mind-blowing that, uh, that God could prophesy these things beforehand and then have it happen exactly like you said. And that's only possible because he is true. His word is true. And this is an evidence for it. And then another evidence, which is, for me is one of my favorites, is the words of Jesus. Have you ever actually read the Sermon on the Mount critically? Not just like reading it and thinking about, oh, this is nice words, nice ideas, but really read it? I mean, what does Jesus say there? Jesus says, love your enemy. Now, for us, it's normal. We've heard it a lot of times. But think about people hearing that for the first time. Love your enemy. That's a crazy thought. You don't love your enemies. The whole point of them being your enemy is that your enemy. You don't love them. You love your friends. You love your neighbors. But your enemy? This is crazy. He says in Matthew, <clears throat> he says in Matthew 5, verse 44, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is a revolutionary thought. Revolutionary. But have you ever tried it? You know what happens if you love your enemy? First off, you start to change, right? You're changing your heart. You're not hating them. You're not bitter to them. You're not trying to get back at them. You're loving them. You start to change. Your heart changes. But in addition, oftentimes, your love for that person will change them. You, if you love your enemy, oftentimes you will stop. They will stop being your enemy because how it's not easy to continue hating somebody if they keep showing you love. So you're doing what this says will not only change you for the better, it will change the other person for the better. And we see this is truth. This is truth. This is something that seems crazy, doesn't make any sense, but when it happens, when you live it out, it is what is right. In addition, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 41, Jesus says, And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. You may or may not know the background of this, but this is the idea that the Romans could conscript people to do certain things. So if they force you to carry a pack, carry something, 
they force you to carry it for a mile. And you can imagine how many people love that, right? But he says, if they force you to go one mile, don't just drop the pack at one mile, go two. Why? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Why would you do that? I mean, you have this rule from the government that you hate, and Jesus is saying, not only follow the rule, go even further beyond what is required of you. But then again, think about it. What happens? What happens if you do this? What happens when you're required to do something that you hate, and the person sees that you hate it, but your response is not bitter, <laughs> grumbling and complaining and cursing. Your response instead is to do more than is required of you. Can you imagine a Roman soldier watching a, uh, an Israelite carry his pack? Right? He's carrying, comes to the first mile, and suddenly he just keeps going. And the Roman soldier says, what's going on? Why are you doing this? Huge opportunity just to share about the truth that you've come to know. Even with a government order that you hate, something forced upon you that you don't like, doing it with joy and going even further than what's required can be a positive witness to the world around us. So these are just two examples. There's a lot, of more, a lot more things where we see that Jesus' words seem so crazy to us, but they are shown to be true when they're lived out. And so another, one more thing there when looking at God's word and thinking about it is that God is faithful to his promises. We see this in scriptures, right? So here's uh, Romans 8, 38 through 39. These are verses that we all love. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow, we love these verses, right? And they're just so powerful. There's nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from God's love. But uh, imagine you're reading this for the first time, and you just stop there for a while to think. Nothing has separated us from God's love. It was there, all these promises. But then an idea, an idea comes to you. Wait a minute. What about the nation of Israel? I mean, God loved them, right? So what's going on with them? I mean, has God forgotten about them? Has he thrown them off? Is he, if he's not faithful to them, how can we know if he's going to be faithful to us? which is exactly why God inspired Paul to write Romans 9 through 11 right after this passage. Romans 9 through 11 is all about this aspect of how, yes, God is still faithful to the nation of Israel and to his promises to them, and he will fully fulfill the promises that he's, gave to them, that he's given to them in the future. This is an important aspect. Paul spends three chapters in the book of Romans centering, circling around this aspect. Because if God is not faithful to them, then he's not, there's no guarantee for us that he will be faithful to us. But in coming to a conclusion in Romans 11, 28, 29, Paul talks about this. He says, as regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, right? talking about the unbelieving Jewish people. But as regards the election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. God doesn't change his mind. Once he has said something, he will do it. He is faithful. He has been faithful to the nation of Israel, to the Jewish people throughout their history, even when they didn't deserve it. And because we see that, we know that he will be faithful to the promises made to us, even when we don't deserve it. Right, so we talked about the fact that God is truth. We talked about the fact that God's word is true, and we see evidence of that. But then it brings us to the aspect of how God's truth changes us, practically. You know, what are we going to do with it? It's nice to have the knowledge, but what, do we, should we, what should be different about us day to day knowing these things? So one more, John 8, verses 31 to 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I love this verse. I mean, John 8 is just an amazing back and forth with Jesus and the people around him. But here is just this powerful place. He says, you will know the truth. If you abide in my word, truly my disciples, you'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. So it's not just a knowledge. It's not just, okay, we're going to know it. We got it. We're good. We know God. He said, there's going to be change. The truth is going to change you. It's going to set you free. It's going to produce something in your life. And I see there's three aspects that God's truth should produce a change in our life. So the first one is kind of obvious, right? We should be truthful. God's veracity, God's truthfulness should lead to the fact that we also are truthful. In Ephesians 4.25, we see, Therefore, having, putting away, having put away falsehood, 
Let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. We speak the truth. It's simple. Don't lie. Right? Don't lie. We actually use this line of thinking with our children when the, the issue of lying start, comes up. They start to lie, which they always do. Trust me, you don't have to teach kids to lie. They figure it out themselves. <clears throat> what we say to them is, does God lie to us? No. Do we as parents lie to you? No. So why are you lying to us? Right? God is our example. If he does not lie, if he is truthful, we also should be truthful. We should not tell lies. And yes, there are some complexities, you know, <clears throat> the arguments to be had. Would you lie to save a life? Would it be wrong? Would it be right? You know, how much of a lie is a half-truth? I mean, do you have to always tell everything? Or can you kind of hold things back? There's complexity there. But this is mostly about the heart change. Right? This is about having a heart that is like God's heart, where we are seeking to be truthful people. That we're seeking to be honest and upfront and not deceive other people. This is an important part. In some cultures, it's easier. Some cultures, less. Different cultures have different ways of looking at this. But we have to look at God and how he is in truthfulness to us and be that way in truthfulness to others. Next is, just as God is faithful, we need to be faithful. Again, simple, straightforward. We need to be reliable. We need to, when we say something, it should happen the way you said it. I uh, had a time of going through this when I was younger and was a bit lazy, maybe more than a bit lazy. And uh, I was living, with, uh, before I was married, I was already living up at the headquarters of our organization that we work with now, Life and Messiah. And uh, there was things they would ask me to do from time to time, this and that. And they had a meeting one time, I heard about this later. They had a meeting one time and one of the guys was saying, yeah, we could get Stephen to do that. And one of the office ladies responded and said, yeah, but will he get it done? Will he actually do it? When I heard about that, it was humiliating for me. I mean, to not be counted upon, for people not to know if you can be relied upon, that's not a godly characteristic. We need to be faithful in what we say and what we do. If we say something, it should, we should do it. We should do everything possible to do it. We should be reliable. We should be able to, people should be able to count on us. And this is the way God is. So it should also be the way we are. And lastly, <clears throat> we should be people of truth. The world doesn't know the truth. It doesn't know the truth. The world doesn't know our God. The world doesn't know our Savior. What they see about truth is what they see in us. We need to be fanatic about being truthful, not just truthful, but being truth in everything we say, not just in spiritual things. When God speaks, it's the truth. It's not just not a lie, right, but truth. <clears throat> and even in things we talked about that don't seem important, God is accurate. He's always true. Can we say the same things about ourselves? Now, obviously, none of us are perfect, right? But uh, do you strive for this? Are you really putting time and effort into making sure that the words that come out of your mouth are truth beyond the shadow of a doubt? Do you research that inflammatory social media post before sharing it? Or do you just click on the button? Do you make it clear when you're having a political conversation that your opinions are just that, opinions, and not God's truth? Before sharing your views about social or cultural issues, do you carefully examine them to make sure that they line up with God's word? If we as believers in Jesus are not careful with this issue of truth in what we say, not only are we failing to be like God, we lose credibility in the eyes of unbelievers. If we're loudly preaching our views on issues which may or may not be true, they're less likely to listen to us when we preach the truth of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, the only truth that we should be sharing passionately with this world around us is the proven truth of Scripture. Everything else is just opinion and conjecture. This is the truth they need. Let's make sure that we are standing on that that is true and not taking strong stands on other things which are doubtful. So to, 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 in conclusion, God's veracity, his truthfulness, is an essential part of who he is. It manifests in the reliability of his word, the Bible, 
and in, the faith, in his faithfulness to the promises he makes. It also influences us as believers as we strive to be like him. May the unbelieving world around us understand the veracity of God as we believers fervently live out these qualities in our daily lives. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your truthfulness. Thank you that you are truth, God. I thank you that you call us to this high standard as well. Father, I pray that you would give us wisdom in day-to-day aspects as we seek to live out truth to the world around us. I pray, God, that you would uh, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, understanding of what we should and shouldn't be focusing on. I pray, God, as we understand more and more the truth of who you are from studying you in your word and seeing how you relate to others, I pray, God, that we would strive fervently to live that same way in our own lives. I thank you, Father, for a, a, a church that we can stand together and encourage one another on in these things. I pray, Father, that this would be something that's on our minds as we, as we walk day to day in this turbulent world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, it's been great talking with you, sharing with you, and uh, we look forward to, to seeing you guys soon.